anybody have any questions? Yeah, just one. Yeah. Sorry, uh, my name is Anne. Um, thanks very much for the yes, really fascinating look forward to seeing the, the film. Um, and I, I have to scoot a few minutes, so I hope you'll take them. Any oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I suppose, like, listening to you in your talk, it, it sounds quite weak. Uh, and I suppose I'd be interested in your view on both the, the likely outcome of, of the situation, if there is an outcome that's, that's pending, and perhaps the, the desirable. I, I come up the situation. If I the likely outcome, I think, in fairness, as somebody who's been observing it now for a while, is obvious. It's more of the same. Mm -hmm. right? um, a, a consolidation of the regime, a consolidation of the Iranian position. But again, as I've explained, it's inflaming regional tension. This is not a status quo that can last. It is not sustainable. The forces pushing it think it seem to give the impression that it is, but it's not. Trump sabotaging the Iran deal, in my view, is probably, I know it seems crazy to say it because he didn't do it for the right reasons, but it may force some kind of regional discussion because as things stand at the moment with the Iranians de facto in occupation in Syria, uh, it's not a sustainable position, which thereby makes the Assad regime an unsustainable position. But at the same time, it has to be admitted, you know, militarily, the opposition has been de facto crushed. Civilians are in a catastrophic position. And even more seriously, something I didn't mention, but you may be aware of if you follow this, that the Assad regime has passed law number 10, which is the most egregious measure, which builds on area legislation, which gives the regime the power to steal, well, confiscate, but to steal the homes of refugees. In other words, they have to come back within a few weeks at the moment and establish their right to their homes in all these areas. And if they can't come home, the great regime can steal those homes. Uh, even in Homs where the land registry was bombed and so forth, that's a very difficult thing to do anyway. Clearly it's again part of the re-engineering Syria to eliminate the opposition, not give them a chance to go back. Again, that only makes Syria more unstable, more unviable. But I mean, from a defensive and military point of view, you might think that easier to hold. But again, it kind of contributes to the general inflaming of the region because the regime is sending a message, we're not returning, clearly present situation is not sustainable and in a sense the West again is totally distracted by the Iran deal. I mean how can the Iran deal be saved if there isn't something done about Syria which is the cockpit now of the Middle East in a way that the Palestinian conflict never was, never was. That was always felt that could lead to a world war. People on the ground would always say well you know the Arab regimes they said they bombed it off about their support for Palestinians but as we saw when Palestinians were butchered in Yarmouk refugee camp outside Damascus. I mean, the Saab and Russia around they massacred Palestinians in the Yarmouk refugee camp. Even, I mean, the uh, the Palestinians in the, in the occupied territories, you know, well, not the people, but the regime, you know, nearly had to be embarrassed into protesting about that. It was, it's just, it's shocking, you know. Uh, but, uh, but your question is obviously the key question. Um, it, it's, I'm more alarmed about that though, because I don't see people appreciating the strategic significance of Syria enough, not just on humanitarian grounds, but with Israel and Iran virtually at war in Syria. I mean, this talk about the Iran deal without fixing Syria is a joke. Thanks very much for an excellent presentation. I think most of us here probably had an interest in the area coming on to the talk, but I think we will go home with a a rich understanding of the the depths of, of how far it sort of goes. Um, my question relates to a, a recent speaker we had here at the Institute. Um, she was from Brookings Institution. She used to work in the State Department. And she was sort of an expert on Turkey. And she was coming out from the Turkey angle talking about Yeah, I missed that unfortunately. Yeah, she talked about the groups that, she talked about the groups that they're backing. And um, afterwards in the discussion, there was a lot of discussion about you know the response and the lack of response from the US. And she really put it back on the audience and sort of said, well, where was the European response here? Yeah. And, um, and, and why is it all these United you know, States that sort of has to step in? And you mentioned throughout your remarks there, Obama, Obama, Obama. I'm just wondering, you know, what could the EU, what could, what could we have done, done differently? I, I think it's, it's a fair question. I was guilty to the audience as the rest of us. You know, we do we give out of an American foreign policy summit, and then we say, look to the Americans and do something. And I mean, I'm passionate European as well. We always wanted independent European foreign policy. But it's a clear example of why it's needed, really. 
I mean, obviously, the Europeans were negligent to the extreme. You know, we wouldn't have a refugee crisis in Europe if Europe had stood up, you know, if we had stood up for the values we're supposed to stand for, you know, human rights, democracy, freedom of expression, social justice, etc., which all of things the Assad regime was dedicated to crushing. So, I mean, uh, clearly, you know, we shouldn't have allowed way back in 2011, when those resolutions were vetoed by the Russian, we should have said, no, we will not accept this. Mm -hmm. We will not accept the regime. We will take severe sanctions action. We will close down this country. Remember, sanctions will work if people want them to work. I mean, uh, you know, you could see the power of American sanctions ability, but the Europeans have equivalent power because they can embarrass the Americans into doing it, particularly at a point in time where the Americans are supposed to be interested in something like this in the Middle East. So it would be possible for them to actually to do something about that. Do you know what I mean? So again, it, it requires a much more vigorous uh, European response. I honestly don't. I mean, the Germans, unfortunately, seem to have a timidity about foreign adventures. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, taking foreign action when it's in Europe's and their own interest. You know, the French are enthusiastic about such adventures. You know, and of course, the Libyan experience may have to some extent colored perceptions mm -hmm. and actions there, which is a bit unfortunate, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but then again, you know, when you think back to the Libyan situation, you know, whether, no matter what, what happened in Libya, we just did what we did in Iraq, you know, there was a failure to appreciate the importance of having police action after the initial military incursion. And again, the Libyan action prevented the massacre in Benghazi. And we know from Syria, if that action hadn't happened, people would have been, would have been, uh, would have been wiped out. And again, it gets back to this kind of realist approach. And I personally think the Europeans are far more realist than the Americans in that sense. Stability, the status quo, they all seem to breathe a big sigh of relief. We don't have to reach a consensus to take action. Well, unfortunately, when you don't take action, it doesn't go away. Look at what's happened. We have a bigger refugee crisis now than, and that was what was supposed to happen if we militarily intervened with a refugee crisis. We have a much bigger one because there's no intervention. And not even military, to go to do other kinds of intervention, I've said, it's even worse now than, 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 uh, than it could be imagined, really, in a sense. And it's led to the destabilization, in many ways, of, of, of Europe. You know, all these right wing governments and the way they. And again, the Russians are malevolently involved, they're stimulating all this electronic uh, through, the, through their various machinations, exploiting it. But again, of course, of course, the West does the same thing as well with them when they get the chance. So, I mean, that's the way the game is played. But the point is, Europe has completely failed. It doesn't have an effective foreign policy. It doesn't have an effective security policy. And Syria exposes why Europe needs one. And it's not about exporting military intervention. As I've said, people in Syria did not want this to turn into a violent conflict because the moment it did, they would suffer too much and they would lose. Um, and Europe could pioneer a new way. Because one thing I really think, I just had a letter in the Irish Times about this just recently because I was. I'm just alarmed about the failure of people generally as well, particularly in the Middle to realise that when Henry Janine, the founder of the Red Cross in the 1860s, thought, you know, they created the old, human, when they created humanitarian law, you know, bombing hospitals, killing the wounded on the battlefield, we're supposed to respect this. And in fairness, for quite a while, that's, that has all died in Syria. Now, people will argue, of course, that Iraq died to some extent in Iraq, and maybe the Israelis in Gaza, I argue, ridiculous. They did still keep some semblance of order there. But in Syria, we have plumbed new depths, and Europe has stood on the sidelines of not just bombing hospitals by mistake, but bombing the same hospital over and over, bombing schools, bombing bread crews, you know, bombing bakeries, bombing whole civilian areas, operating a scorched earth policy you know, in the region. I mean, there is no humanitarian law in my view anymore. I mean, I think it's gone. Uh, because it certainly hasn't been respected in Syria, and I didn't see any major protests from, well, they might make perfunctory objections. But in other words, Europe is clearly not pursuing its own interests, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, because there's a lot we could have done from the very beginning, as I've said, you know, because I think people always come first when we think about military action, mm -hmm. and sometimes it is necessary, you know, you need the no fly zones and so forth. But long before you get to military action, there are sanctions regimes. There are ways of cutting off these regimes. We see it now with the Trump uh, administration and Iran. And we now suddenly see how effective these sanctions regimes can be. Those sanctions regime, that sanctions regime, if it had been applied to Iran over Syria, would have stopped the sad a long time ago in Syria. 
Now, the Europeans, on the other hand, have equal amount of power and more skin in the game. Because, as I repeat, we would not have a refugee crisis if Europe had taken radical action early on. But, why? I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I think there's too much timidity. There's a, a failure to embrace an active foreign policy. You know, it is a fact it's difficult to most of the European powers to, to agree on things. Mm -hmm. And then they fall into the usual Western response, stability in the Middle East, which basically means leave the brutal dictators in place, let them repress people. And that's what they think is a solution in Syria now by leaving Assad. That is not a solution. It's definitely not a solution at the moment. Because what you're saying now is, it's not about leave Assad in place, it's leave Iran in occupation. And I was highly amused the other day when apparently Putin is reputed to have said he would try to persuade Iran to leave Syria. I mean, that is, that the Iranians probably all fell around and laughed because they're actually, look, we won in Syria. You know, you just took the, you took the lap of honor because we didn't want to take the lap of honor because we're trying to humor the Americans to get the Iran here. So we had to let you take the credit, but be under no illusions. No one in the Middle East is sort of aware now that the Iranians are dug in. And the reputation raised in the Middle East for intervention is very well known because the Quds Force, you see it, what's going on in Yemen, but across the region, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, they were founded essentially to protect the Iranian Revolution. And the Quds Force is their foreign operation, basically. And they really do meddle across the Middle East. Now, I realize some of you may think, I have, my brain has been taken over by Israeli propagandists. But it's, I would suggest to you, it's worth doing a little bit of research about them, though. Because as the Israelis are in their occupation. I truly was shocked the more research I did on the Iranians because you would imagine for practical economic reasons the Iranians might have been a bit more restrained because their economy is in such dire shape. But no way. The Iranian economy today is in dire shape because they are underwriting the Assad regime. And they're not doing that to the Assad regime. They're doing that to, a, you know, to further their imperial ambitions to become the reason of hegemon to fulfill the objectives of their revolution, which you know, don't want to give the impression they're idealistic about, but essentially they see security and dominance as most powers, I suppose, do if they get away with it. Just taking, you know, Obama's position in 2013, and, you know, he obviously was having some other power on one side, but he was, he was deeply affected by Rwanda, and was, was very, you know, interventionist in that sense, and, and he was kind of, all of the different experiences of the United States that he was trying to work through with Libya and Iraq and even going back to Vietnam, was thinking, you know, he just was always a, an ardent anti interventionist, was, was arguably elected on that mandate of it because he was boasted about not about, um, voting for the Iraq war. But I, I still am not quite clear where the action could be because, you know, you have a sanctions regime and you put off the regime fine and it collapses, but then you have a, a, a power vacuum and then you have to. No, it's a fair. It's obviously it's obviously a fair question, you know. But the problem is, you see, um, there was no commitment to engagement with Syria. Syria poses problems at the time because the opposition was very fragmented. The Syrian opposition did not make it easy for people because they were they didn't, you know, in in Libya, for example, there was much more war and it was easy to support and so forth. So it did require a certain commitment. But I remember the line which they pursued was. Tell us who the good guys are in Syria. That's a very cynical response because they got the intel reports. They knew that stability in Syria required a political transition and it needed to be managed. The problem in Syria was to get the Assad regime to negotiate, something had to be done to convince the regime the West would take action to, shall we say, effect change. So action was needed to convince them of that fact. And, you know, it does require engagement. But as I say, we have to just avoid falling into this militaristic kind of trap, or this trap of just discussing military options. The fact is a political solution was needed in Syria, and it needed engagement. We're pretending that, you know, it couldn't have been done, you know, that it was too complex and that but things could, because look, what could be worse than what's happened? More than half a million are dead. The whole region has been destabilized. The global uh, power balance has, global system has potentially been destabilized by Syria because we're in the middle of a dynamic process that's still playing out that hasn't happened. And as I say, everyone in this room 
may yet end up suffering as a result in very practical terms. So what I would say is, Obama basically washed his hands of it. But the truth is, of course, he was given the water and the towel by uh, the UK Parliament, in other words, by us, by the European, the Europeans more generally. And again, admittedly, everybody might have been coloured by Iraq. But the problem is, we're all kind of, uh, we've allowed ourselves to be sucked into that sort of uh, military analysis, or that just allowing ourselves to be, to be, uh, to for, be forced, if you like, into confronting the situation in military terms, rather than forcing us to confront it as individuals, as societies, watching other individuals, families and societies being brutally murdered in mass human rights violations and not calling out those war crimes. i give you one example about this which was raised in the documentary by, we met Ken Roth as well in New York, he's the head of Human Rights Watch, and he was the first person just to use the phrase, you know, war against civilians, which sounds kind of a loaded term, you know, sort of uh, almost a, uh, a partisan phrase in a sense, but the truth is that's exactly what they've done. It's the military strategies I've been outlining earlier. You know, they focus on civilians. You bomb civilians. You force them to flee. You want that's really what gave ISIS the chance to come in because as they destroyed the revolutionary infrastructure of democratic coordination committees, women's rights groups, new groups, because a flowering of civil society occurred during revolution. Perhaps you bomb the civilians, you destroy that, and you make it easy for these extremist elements to come in. But obviously, Obama would be very familiar with all that. But just to show you, even when Aleppo, when civilians in Aleppo were being slaughtered, Obama, and Ken Roth made that point on, on, on tape as well, he said, Obama, instead of calling Putin out for all those war crimes, being committed to crimes against humanity, bombing, he called Putin a partner in peace as he kept that fiction of those negotiations going. So it was very cynical, very ruthless, very realist. But as I say, as we see with this Iran deal falling apart now, but as I would argue, even if Trump hadn't sabotaged it, with Syria effectively, like it's, it has been dismantled effectively, with massive foreign influence, um, you know, the scene is set for a very unfortunate denouement at the moment. And uh, it just gets back to the, my fundamental argument, which is, unless we really see our mission as individuals and communities really as genuine be committed and prepared to fight for human rights for others, for freedom, for justice. You know, in in solidarity with other people as people. You know, we have to reach beyond. I know this sounds very idealistic now. As somebody who's a little bit not in the relations. And I'm still trying to work this out in my own mind as well. But let's not kid ourselves. They'll always go back to the default position of stability which may paper over the cracks for another couple of years, but I promise you, there will be another explosion. And the problem at the moment is, and this is one thing I found very alarming, actually. I mean, I really found this the most alarming of all. Yeah, I know we're out of time now. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna leave you on the most depressing part of all. <laughs> it's fascinating that the Saudis and the Iranians have no contact. They don't intermarry. They don't meet each other. They're remarkably disconnected in a way that few countries are in the same, even in the same region. It's remarkable. I know there are Sunnis and Shia, but when you analyze it, it really is very disturbing. If two countries were ever, shall we say, developed to go to war, it's Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I, I can promise you, it may, it's not going to be like the first world war in the trenches. It may only take a few days of the year. It will draw in a lot of countries in that battle. But we still draw so much oil from the Middle East. And you need have no fear that the Iranian strategy, while the Saudis are committed to protecting their oil fields, I don't know whether you know the structure of Saudi's oil fields. <laughs> well, they haven't developed the shield yet to do that, particularly when the other other crap, the other the other adversary, the Iranian adversary, has the means to, shall we say, to get around the current defenses. That's not possible. So I do hope we all escape the economic implications of that war because I think it might make the last recession look rather mild, you know? <laughs> okay, well, I'm, um, I just want to thank you again. For, unless there's any other questions that people have. Quite, yeah, quick question. Uh, just in terms of how strong do you think the commitments to democracy was among the Syrian opposition? Um, like, Start the revolution. Like I saw in the video, you 
presumably sort of liberal or West, slightly westernised, um, presumably urban, um, well educated people talking about democracy. But like, in some of the of stronger areas of like in Eastern Cuba, for example, you will not be very conservative. People who come from the countryside live in a place like that. Like, were they really, was it really about democracy or was it more about sort of just sort of dignity, like just wanting the end of sort of regime? Like, what, how strong was the. Was yeah, the I, think it's a, I think it's a good question, right? But I think what I would say is it was a very much, I mean, to be honest, this is, this is a country and a people who were subjected to one of the to effectively a totalitarian style regime. You know, they were brutally repressed. Uh, and they definitely were about dignity. That was a, a word that was used in all the protests. Freedom was used. Uh, justice, I think, was used. God was used, because they tend to be quite well, but not in, a, in, a, in an extremist way. Um, but there's no doubt about it. At the same level, you must remember, there are people like Yassin al Hajsai. The Syrians, in educational terms, are quite, it's quite a well-developed country. Uh, definitely Western democracy would have influenced a lot of these people, even people like Yassin. Yassin would be, I mean, in terms of the approach to democracy, he's not a, he definitely knows what democracy means. So I really think, you know, the leadership, as most of these revolutions tend to be quite middle class, but the Syrian revolution, strangely enough, was quite a working class revolution because it was one of the big motors for such a popular uprising were the neoliberal policies quite ruthlessly implemented by the Assad regime because initially Assad's father bought off a lot of these disaffected groups and poor people and so forth, certain kind of social reforms. But as the economy changed and they began going much more towards a neoliberal, get rid of the welfare state type approach, and that's very crude oversimplification, they did share a lot of opposition support at the opposition at the at the ground level. But I would say myself, it was you know very much a, a pretty broad-based, spontaneous type movement. But I was very impressed by the sophistication of many of the urban elements as well committed to it. And I would stress to you as well too, the unity between the religion, of the various religions, you know, Christians, Druids, etc., were also involved. Because and it's also worth bearing in mind as well to reinforce that point that having interviewed prisoners were tortured as well too. Many of them met people other religions in prison as well too. So do not underestimate the depth and breadth of that. Uh, and certainly, you know, I mean, obviously, definitely getting rid of dictatorship was the overwhelming priority there. But uh, the, the Syrians have greatly impressed me. It's a very sophisticated society, large, sex, well educated people. It, it's a very Western place. You can visit a place like Damascus as well, too. So please do not underestimate the Syrians in that sense. Yeah, not very coordinated. It was quite spontaneous in some respects. And people very much worked it out in a very fundamental kind of democratic way. You know, local councils at the local level, in opposition areas, you know, people feeling for freedom, first mass development of free newspapers and free media, because the first time they had an opportunity in years to express themselves and so forth. You know, it would almost bring tears to one's eyes, almost, you know, the idealism of, all of that. But I would have no doubt it was a genuine impulse that prioritised freedom of expression, uh, dignity, as you make the words very good work, because it's used all the time. You know, people would suffer the indignities of, of dictatorship, wanted to get rid of, and certainly they were aware of what Western democracy looks like, and they really consider what we have would be very much uh, a very desirable and the ultimate. Okay, well, I think that's a little more positive way to uh, end the event. Really, thank you very much, John, for coming along. It's not usually if somebody spends over an hour giving away a movie that you've not been interested in seeing it, but I think we're all going to go home and try to download the movie this weekend, so um, thanks very much for giving us that introduction. No, it was a pleasure. Thanks very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to stick around maybe if people want to have another drink to catch up, and I don't know, maybe feel free to join us for another. Yeah, certainly. If anybody has any more questions, and more questions.